Thanks, Marianne, and thanks to the Society for giving me the opportunity. This is certainly a diverse audience. Uh, the people I met yesterday on the, on the Lou Tour, the London Lou Tour, Rachel's back there, if you want to learn about sanitation in its birthplace, that's the lady, uh, to the conversations today. It's been really very fascinating for me to see the diversity. So uh, Marianne, when she approached me, asked me to speak about our motivation for water stewardship work, uh, then to narrow in on uh, the types of wash interventions that we've been involved in and what we've learned over the last 10 or 12 years of doing this type of work. So that's exactly what I will present. Before I do, it, the closest I've come to this type of audience in terms of the health-based uh, focus, uh, the disease focus on wash, is every year for about the last five or six years, I missed one year in between, at the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that's based in Atlanta where I'm headquartered, uh, they bring in, and I'm sure they do this in other capacities, but there's a week or two during the year where they bring in health ministers, either country level health ministers or regional or deputies sort of mid-level rising stars to get immersed in what the CDC does, to exchange best practices, what have you. And I always jump at the chance because I, I tell them what maybe they don't want to hear. And when I look at their agenda, when I hear their hallway conversations for the week or two that they're there, they're focused on what I call sort of the sexy chronic diseases. That's where the money is, that's where the, the focus is. So they're looking at malaria, Maybe sexy is a bad word for that, but um, uh, tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, all very important. And they have no attention in that two, three weeks that they're there on waterborne and fecal matter related diseases that we're here to discuss. And so I always call them out on that because it's solvable, it's affordable, uh, there are challenges, but it, it, it's almost like wallpaper to them. And so I think it's important uh, that the society has put this together and that everyone is here and earlier today there was discussions about uh, research that's needed uh, to focus on certain modalities and intervention points and the technologies that are evolving. And I think all that's there uh, but a, a case was made somewhat implicitly this morning that that type of research is needed to build the business case or the justification for donors or, or funding or country level policy changes. And while certainly welcome, uh, there's always going to be the need for more research and new technologies and, and, and new analyses. But the business case for WASH already exists. I mean, if we can see that as a private business, uh, everyone else should be able to see that. I mean, there's enough research as it is, but on top of that, common basic dignity, privacy, security, the calories, the time you save in fetching. Uh, water, the problems with sanitation. I mean, the business case exists, and I don't think we should try to couch further progress in meeting, which we won't, the Millennium Development Goals, and then ultimately the Sustainable Development Goals by saying that there's a need for additional research before we can act. So a bit on my high horse here. A bit on our motivation. So we operate in all but two countries, North Korea and Cuba. We have plants and operations quite extensively throughout the rest of the world. And all of those operations are not export, or non-export rather. And so whether it's 54 plants in India, seven in Cameroon, 85 in the United States, whatever the case may be, they manufacture, they source, employ, manufacture, and distribute, sell our products to a contiguous marketplace. And so when we look at social and environmental issues, there's room for CSR, and we certainly have those types of programs. But because water is so fundamental to our business, so fundamental to our very, very large agricultural ingredient supply chain, and so fundamental to communities, in this case, our marketplace, this becomes a strategic business priority for us. We see water stresses manifest themselves as much in the developing world, developed world as in the developing world. Might surprise many of you, I'm not sure about the statistics in the UK, but uh, in Canada and the United States alone, you have anywhere from eight to 13 million people without access to water and or 
sanitation is improved by the, as defined by the Millennium Development Goals. So even something that basic is not universal, even though statistics might round those numbers up to 100. I'm curious uh, what it is here in, in the UK. But that global footprint and reliance on water and that local business model is what drives our need to understand water issues holistically and respond to them well beyond our supply chain and our direct manufacturing operations. I covered that. So the road to getting there and the motivation was to quantify risks, risk to our business, risk to our supply chain, really risks to the ability to, to protect manufacturing capacity and where sustainable to be able to grow that. And so the risks then, in a very quantitative, comprehensive fashion, allowed us to develop both a global strategy as well as local strategies of how to respond to those risks and help sustain and grow our markets, which are the very communities that we're a part of. And so this strategy uh, in its infancy was developed and, and later refreshed and takes us on the left-hand side, yes, things inside our direct operations, water quality, efficiency, wastewater treatment, stormwater management, that's bread and butter, that's table stakes. Uh, extending that into our very large agricultural ingredient supply chain, and that may be pretty obvious, but it's where you look to the right that the strategy and the risks and, and hence the execution has taken us, and that is into the shared watersheds that we're a part of, into communities, developed world and developing world to work together on their issues. And then on the far right hand side, a place for advocacy and education and awareness, but I would say the fastest growing area for us, for our global business system, is in policy. It's direct engagement multilaterally with others to federal governments on water policy reform as being the ultimate solution to a lot of the really big problems uh, that we face. So that's a bit of the motivation of why we do what we do on water. We use this rough uh, rubric here in deciding how we're going to respond in a very local situation. The thousand odd bottling plants, the 5,000 material supply points from an agriculture standpoint. We take some combination of understanding the local risks and translating them into what their ultimate as well as proximate drivers are. It's usually a combination of ecological and human health. And then that gives us the clear business case to respond in one of those four categories. And you could throw policy in as, as an overarching uh, across all of those. So that's why and how we act on water. A couple of examples and then a couple of uh, lessons learned, actually three lessons learned. So a couple examples, uh, we do all of this in partnership. Uh, we have partners, some of which are here in the room. Uh, we seek to match our funding, at least on a one-to-one -one basis, so that our resources are amplified with somebody else with similar objectives, and that we can, of course, do more in that regard plus leverage each other's resources on monitoring and evaluation and things like that. And so this is one that we started at the very outset of this work in 2005 with uh, USAID. And so it's been a one-to-one -one matching program, largely in sub-Saharan Africa, largely on safe water access and to some extent the complete wash equation. But it is a broad partnership. I need to update the slides because we're actually up to about $40 million dollars. Uh, in co-financing between the two of us. This is just a snapshot of uh, the type, types or rather scale of projects and the way we pool together different funding sources. This one is in Malawi. Uh, and one lesson learned here is one that we learned very early on. Apologies to the technology people here in the room, but I think it should be clear to most of us um, that you don't lead wash interventions with a pre-selected technology, at least in our opinion. Uh, the soft stuff is the hard stuff, the, the communications, the financing, the long-term capital or cost recovery, the training, the capacity building. And if you go in with a pre-selected technology, you have to bend all that 
soft people stuff around uh, something that is going to predefine what your supply chain looks like, what your operations are going to look like, what have you. Play Pumps International is a great example if you want to look at a case study of why you don't lead with a technology. Technologies are important, they certainly are necessary, but you end up selecting that, at least in our experience, near the end of the project. And that was one of the key learnings that we've had. Hmm? Here, here? Okay, yeah. It's not like the House of Lords. Here, here, right? Here. I love watching that on TV. Um, another type of project and, and some of the work we're doing with uh, USAID is incorporated in this, but to give you a sense of the scale that we operate in, we're not the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but we do make some significant investments. This one made at the height of the financial crisis because this is strategic and business imperative, not philanthropy. It's this Replenish Africa initiative to bring access to safe water to two million people by the end of next year, which we will meet and in fact exceed. And later this year, we'll be announcing a future goal for rain in terms of uh, 2020. Another project uh, here to give you a sense again of the scale and the types of partners that we engage. You see an NGO, you see of course our system of our bottling partners and ourselves, and importantly, you see the government. Now here's another lesson learned that might be a little controversial. Um, so I might need one extra minute. <laughs> kind of, the first exposure I had to somebody that was really active in international transboundary sort of water resources writ large is John Briscoe, who's currently with Harvard University. At the time, he was the director of water resources for the World Bank. And this is back in the mid 80s. And he was speaking at a technology conference in New Orleans, Louisiana, in the United States. And he had followed the mayor who was talking about challenges in infrastructure funding, and he presented this fascinating research, which I can, if you don't know about it, I can point to you, point you to it. But basically how communities, whether it's you going on a holiday outing and you're going to camp, or you're the city of Lagos or in London, mature from across the wash spectrum from wanting access to water, wanting access to clean water, water, clean in the home, even piped, then waste out of the home, then waste out into the environment beyond the community, and then having waste treated. And if you look at how London, as we learned in our Lou tour yesterday, but you look at the United States, you look at China, societies and peoples tend to evolve that way. And it's with time that they get the understanding of the need for both the scientific and the social and the cultural understanding to have waste removed, and it, it then has that stigma, then they understand the health impacts, then they're willing to support financially, politically, whatever the case may be, the need to convey that waste out of their community and ultimately protect downstream communities inclusive of, of the environment. So from safe water access to full sanitation, hygiene education, and and it's been my experience, and this is just a theory of mine, that when we step in, we in this collective community, with a full wash solution, we're putting the cart before the horse. And it might be worth further research, even though I said we don't need that. Um, but to think about that when you, when you step into somebody who's been open defecating and fetching water from the river, and you give them a solution that, that solves all of that. The other lesson that we learned from the interventions in schools um, is the difficulty from water access to sanitation to hygiene and long-term behavior change. In my experience, and we've got projects in about 3,000 locations, uh, it said 509 projects, but Molly is a project for us and we've got 50 different locations. So we've got about 3,000 communities where we're doing uh, wash projects around the world. And in my experience, and many of our implementing partners and co-funding partners, water access is at one level. Solving long-term, sustainably sanitation is an order of magnitude more difficult. And then 
not hygiene education, but behavior change on hygiene, hygiene practices, is an order of magnitude more difficult than that. I don't mean more expensive. I don't mean more time consuming. I mean more challenging from a human sustainability standpoint. Getting people to understand, be educated about hygiene practices is one thing. Getting them to sustain them over time after you've provided clean water and you've got the sanitation across the value chain is gentleman from the Gates Foundation so uh, eloquently described, if they don't wash their hands at the end of the day, none of that matters. And we don't know how to do that. We don't, I don't think society knows how to do it. And if you need proof, go to the men's room. I'm not sure about the ladies, but there's a sign reminding you to wash your hands. And so here we are in the 21st century and we have to remind ourselves, oh, I just went to the bathroom, I gotta wash my hands. You go to restaurants and pubs, I know here in London I've seen them, you certainly see them in the States, employees must wash their hands. So that long-term behavior change at the end of the day is very challenging, uh, in my opinion. So we work with a lot of partners and we have to, we're not an NGO, we're not the government. And the last three lessons learned, and it was the first three questions that we asked uh, when we first started doing this type of work, was, okay, we know how to treat water, we're the Coca-Cola company, so I get all that. And I know you've got this technology and you've got these funding sources. You know, I took purely, we took purely a business point of view from, uh, towards it and asked these three questions. It's like, regardless of what you're going to do, and this gets to the soft stuff being the hard stuff, these three questions you need to solve up front, at least on paper, at least in your mind, and in discussion with the local community. How do they communicate with each other to an ultimate supply chain, to a regulator? I mean, physically, how does it happen? You may just assume it's a mobile phone. You may assume it's the post, the mail. Those are bad assumptions because those don't exist uh, in many parts of the world. And then with that, I lump banking. You know, particularly when you solve that finance stream, as you were saying, money's changing hands. How do they store money? How do they move money? How do they secure money? How do they accrue money? How can you get a bank account? So understanding that along with how they communicate before you start picking technologies and ultimate solutions is very important to understand because it will influence how you do that work. Then, of course, what is the supply chain for my ultimate uh, technology or process, supply chain for waste disposal from sanitation, for soap, for filters, for spare parts, for a little cotter pin to hold the hand pump. What is that supply chain and how is it developed or how can it be developed? And then, uh, you've said it better than I can, how are you going to finance this? And that finance, for us, our approach with our donor partners, our implementation partners, is to fund the philanthropic fund in a grant way the initial capex, but to put in place a system of full cost recovery for operations and maintenance. What we haven't solved, and I think it's only the government eventually that can solve it, is how do you get that full cost recovery for full replacement at the end of the useful life of that equipment? So I can fund your wash intervention with cash. I can help you put in a system that allows for the generation and the dedication of funds for the operation and maintenance. But that equipment's gonna give out. And so where is the money to build the new toilet, to build the new water treatment system? And I don't know who can do that other than governments. It's, it's really hard and you don't wanna go back, but that's just some lessons learned. Thanks.